In our videos, we present overwhelming evidence that the current apostasy in Rome is the fulfillment of apocalyptic prophecy about the Whore of Babylon and the return of the beast that was, that is, pagan Rome in the last days. The Whore of Babylon is not the Catholic Church, but the prophesied end times counter church, the Vatican II sect. In this video, we will cover some additional striking facts that further support our conclusion about the end times beast and the Antichrist. The Apocalypse says that the beast has seven heads, and it defines the seven heads as seven mountains and seven kings. The seven mountains are Rome, and the seven kings refer to the seven priest kings of the Vatican city-state. Since the prophecy connects the seven kings to the end times beast, you cannot recognize the end times beast without recognizing who the seven kings are. In 1929, a brand new historically verifiable kingdom was established in Rome by the Lateran Treaty. The kingdom is called the Vatican city-state. Pope Pius XI, a valid pope, was the first king of the Vatican city-state. Antipope Benedict XVI was the seventh. The kingship of the first king, Pius XI, was formally announced on Monday, February 11th in 1929 with the signing of the Lateran Treaty. Strikingly, the seventh king, Benedict XVI, formally announced his resignation on a Monday, February 11th in 2013 in a shocking announcement that was followed by two lightning strikes at the top of St. Peter's Basilica, the very place where St. Peter is buried. Now the Apocalypse tells us that the beast rises when five of the kings are fallen and one is. Thus, the beast rises during the reign of the sixth king. If the seven kings of the Vatican city-state are the seven kings of prophecy, and they are, then the end times beast, namely pagan Rome slash the pagan Roman Empire, should have risen or returned during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king of the Vatican city-state, and that is exactly what happened. The beast rose politically during the reign of John Paul II because the European Union is the reconstituted pagan Roman Empire, and it was officially formed in 1993 during the reign of John Paul II. The symbol of Europe, which is used by the European Union, is Europa, a woman on a beast. Well, a woman sitting on a beast is precisely what St. John describes in Apocalypse 17. St. John was describing pagan Europe, or pagan Rome, if you refer to Europe from the standpoint of its spiritual leadership in the last days. Portraits have long been used in banknotes all over the world. And research has shown that people tend to remember faces. That's why we chose to include a face in the second series of Euro banknotes. The hologram and the watermark include an image of Europa, a figure from Greek mythology. Our continent was named after her, and we found a perfect illustration in the Louvre of how she was depicted over 2,000 years ago. Au centre de l'image et au premier plan se trouvent les deux protagonistes. Donc à gauche, cette jeune femme, donc bouclée, parée de bijoux, donc un collier, des bracelets, vêtue d'un vêtement finement plissé. Et devant elle, donc un taureau, d'une blancheur éclatante, nous disent les textes, et qui semble s'incliner devant elle dans un geste de révérence. Il s'agit bien donc d'Europe et de Zeus métamorphosé en taureau. And just as the beast rose politically with the EU when five of the kings of the Vatican city-state had fallen, it also rose spiritually at that time with John Paul II, the sixth king. This aspect of the prophecy is even more significant than the rising of the political dimension of the beast with the EU. The beast rose spiritually during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king, because Antipope John Paul II was a pagan Roman king who literally taught that every man, including himself, is God and the Son of God. We prove that in our material. John Paul II preached the worship of man and he introduced idolatry into the empire just as pagan Roman emperors did. In his very first homily, John Paul II declared that man is the Christ of Matthew 16, 16. In his first encyclical, he defined the gospel as the amazement at man and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. See our video, John Paul II's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and his spiritual victims. Throughout his anti-papacy, he systematically preached that the Son of God became every man in the incarnation, and therefore that every man is the Son of God. See our video, quote, St. John Paul II exposed. The reason that John Paul II was preaching that man is God and blaspheming the Holy Spirit right from the start of his reign is that pagan Rome, that is, the beast, was spiritually rising with him, the sixth king, when five were fallen, exactly as it was prophesied. In his role as a pagan Roman king who was preaching that man is God, John Paul II was duplicating what pagan Roman kings in the pagan Roman Empire did. More on that in a bit. 
Now, Apocalypse 13.3 tells us that one of the heads of the beast, and remember, each head is a king associated with Rome, seemed to have a mortal wound, but the wound was healed. Therefore, it tells us that one of the Roman kings seemed to have a mortal wound, but it was healed. That fits precisely with John Paul II, a Roman king of the Vatican City-State, and his famous wounding on May 13, 1981 in St. Peter's Square. That event was a key part of the deception that surrounded his reign. In Apocalypse 13.14, we are told that the people are deceived to make an image for the one who was wounded by the sword and lived. That again fits John Paul II, who, despite his shocking apostasy and career of heresy, indifferentism, and blasphemy, was solemnly, quote, canonized by the Vatican II sect after his death, with his image being honored at St. Peter's Basilica, the Temple of God. That, quote, canonization has no validity for true Catholics because it was proclaimed by Francis, who is an antipope. According to Catholic teaching, heretics are automatically expelled from the church and cannot hold office in it. Accepting the idolater and heretic John Paul II as a saint is the means by which masses are implicated in the evils that he promoted. Pope St. John Paul II. Pope St. John Paul the Great. St. John Paul. St. John Paul. I'm not questioning his personal holiness. St. John Paul II. Of course, St. John Paul II. It's a term given to these teachings of St. John Paul the Great. Two of the great uh, saints of our times are St. Padre Pio and St. John Paul II. Now consider this. The Greek word for short sword or dagger in Apocalypse 13.14, as in the one who was wounded by the sword and lived, is makairis, a genitive form of makaira. Guns did not exist in St. John's time. Thus, a wounding by a handgun at close range would reasonably be described by the biblical writer as a wounding by the sword. Yet in 2008, it was revealed that on May 12, 1982, about a year after his wounding in St. Peter's Square, John Paul II was literally stabbed during his visit to Fatima. This fact was not publicly revealed until 2008, and we didn't know about it until recently. Quote, the late Pope John Paul II was wounded by a knife-wielding priest in 1982, a year after he was shot in St. Peter's Square, but the injury was kept secret, his former top aide says in a documentary film. A crazed, ultra-conservative Spanish priest lunged at the Pope with a dagger and was knocked to the ground by police and arrested. The fact that the knife actually reached the Pope and cut him was not known until now. I can now reveal that the Holy Father was wounded." End quote. Amazing. If you look up the Greek word makaira, the one used in Apocalypse 13.14, you will see that one of the primary definitions is a dagger. So, even though we believe that the shooting of John Paul II in 1981 fulfills the prophecy of Apocalypse 13 about the wounding of one of the kings of the beast, in order to remove any objection that John Paul II is in view in this prophecy, about a year later he was literally stabbed by a short sword or a dagger, and a primary definition of makaira is a dagger. How much more evidence do you need that John Paul II was referred to in this prophecy, and therefore that what's happening in Rome now is the fulfillment of end times prophecy about the return of the beast that was, just as we have said? Well, there's even more. Concerning the seventh king, the apocalypse says that, quote, he must remain a short time, end quote. That fits Benedict XVI, the seventh king, who resigned in 2013 after a reign that was comparatively short, more than three times shorter than that of the sixth king. But watch this. In 2005, just after his, quote, election, Benedict XVI predicted that his reign would be short. Quote, Benedict XVI predicted a short reign in comments to cardinals just after his election, end quote. Whether he realized the significance or not, Benedict XVI made that statement in 2005 because he was the seventh king who would reign for a short time. After his resignation, various outlets such as ABC News described his reign as short. Quote, in spite of his rather short tenure, Benedict XVI has had a distinct impact. End quote. Antipope Benedict XVI was the seventh king, and the apostate Antipope Francis is not one of the seven kings for two reasons. We've covered this in detail elsewhere, but first, the Vatican City State is a sacerdotal monarchy, a priest kingdom, and Francis is not a valid priest, having been, quote, ordained in the invalid new rite of Paul VI. Therefore, Francis is not qualified to be a priest king of the sacerdotal monarchy, the Vatican City State. Second, Francis openly rejects all aspects of kingship. His repudiation of all aspects of kingship in contradistinction to Benedict XVI is a sign to all that Benedict XVI, even though he was an apostate antipope, was the seventh and final king of the prophecy. Now, the apocalypse tells us that the beast was and is not and is to come, and that the people on earth who are not written in the book of life shall wonder when they see the beast that was and is not and is to come. 
The wonder at the beast refers to the shock, astonishment, amazement, and disturbed confusion people experience over what has happened in Rome after Vatican II. Starting with John XXIII, heretical antipopes who were not validly elected to the papacy took possession of the Vatican in accord with prophecy, and this led to the Vatican II revolution. As a consequence, the city of Rome lost the faith and returned to paganism, idolatry, and unbelief, reducing the true Catholic Church to a faithful remnant in the final days. Rome's return to paganism, idolatry, and unbelief in the post-Vatican II period has caused shock, wonder, and disturbed confusion among those who lack the grace and faith to recognize that a counter-church led by antipopes, not the true Catholic Church, is now in Rome and has taken control of the Temple of God and the Church's physical structures. Father Murray, what is this, in your estimation, and are good intentions enough to receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church? Uh, this is really a disaster, I'll say it straight out. It's a direct contradiction of what the Church has always taught. This is casting aside the message of the Gospel. You're not allowed to commit adultery. That's quite, that's the sixth commandment. You know, one thing that really puzzles me in this whole discussion is the resistance to describing things as they are. This is confusing. Yeah. yeah. There's something very odd going on here. So there's, there's some very, very strange confusion that is spreading out and out yeah. from this desire to, to regularize the irregular. This, this is what we seem to be seeing, and it is very confusing to the people at home and the people watching all over the world, not just here in the United States or at this table. What's happening? What are these men doing? It's very difficult to, to understand. I just read this for like the second or third time today and I'm still having trouble believing it's not fake news. The Pope giving the green light to shacking up. I, I'm sorry to be sarcastic. I can't, I don't know what to do with this anymore. I honestly don't. But friends, why? Why can't the Pope just issue a document that's just full on orthodox right out of the gate? Where does this come from? What is going on anymore? I don't know what to make of this. Holy mackerel. What is this man doing? It's just unbelievable. Why is, there a, why is there a liturgical action? I mean, we as Catholics see bowing down, burning of incense before these Pachamamas, processing them around on the stations of the cross, processing them into St. Peter's Square, processing them up to the altar in St. Peter's Basilica where the first Pope, St. Peter, is buried. How are we as baptized Catholics supposed to understand this? I don't know. <laughs> what do you do with this? How much, how much worse does it have to get? How much more absurd does it have to get? Heck, what is going on? Since they don't understand and refuse to recognize that what's occupying Rome and the Vatican now is not the Catholic Church but the end times beast and whore of Babylon, they are mystified and utterly perplexed to see paganism and apostasy and all kinds of heresy coming from the place where they expect Catholicism to be taught. This is the prophesied wonder at the beast. The reaction of so many to the paganism and evil in post-Vatican II Rome is a very striking and clear fulfillment of this prophecy. What's happened at this synod is the exact opposite. What they're doing is they're uh, taking a world which still has remnants of Christian truth to it, and they're paganizing it. It should also be noted that when describing how the beast is about to rise during the reign of the sixth king, Apocalypse 17.8 says that the beast was and is not. The beast was at that time because it existed under the pagan Roman Empire. It is not at that time, just before the beast rises with the EU during the reign of John Paul II. It is to come at that time, when five are fallen, because from that standpoint in time, pagan Rome was about to return in the future when the EU was formed during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king. The return of pagan Rome, the return of the beast, is why paganism is now celebrated and practiced in the Vatican to the shock of the masses. In 2019, a statue of Moloch, the false god of child sacrifice, was put on display in Rome near the Colosseum. This happened just seven days before the pagan idol Pachamama was worshipped in the Vatican gardens and, quote, blessed by anti-Pope Francis. These are just some of the examples of how pagan Rome has returned in fulfillment of prophecy. Many people can't understand how or why these kinds of things could be happening in Rome. Our material explains why. The most significant example of the return of paganism to Rome is found in the religious indifferentism and heresies officially preached by the Vatican II antipopes and in the false doctrines of the Vatican II religion. Let's now consider another striking fulfillment of the prophecy about the return of the beast, that is pagan Rome, in our time. 
First, note that while Roman emperors were technically speaking emperors rather than kings, they were in reality kings. See, for example, John 19.15, where Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor at the time, is referred to as a king. There we read that people who called for Christ's crucifixion stated, We have no king but Caesar. Hence, Roman emperors were de facto Roman kings, and the honor given to the pagan Roman emperor and his image was honor given to a pagan Roman king. Now, in the pagan Roman Empire, emperor worship was practiced. In various ways, certain Roman emperors were treated as if they were divine. However, it's extremely important to note that in the capital itself, that is, at Rome itself, in the official state cult, an emperor could only receive divine worship after he had died. This is crucial in understanding an aspect of what's happening in the Vatican now and how it fulfills prophecy about the return of the beast that was. Here are a few quotes on this point. In a commentary on the book of Revelation, Grant Osborne notes, quote, While the Greeks gave divine status to living rulers, the Romans traditionally did not declare their emperors gods until after their deaths. However, this was more the case in Rome itself, end quote. As Stephen Friesen says in a book on imperial cults and the apocalypse of John, quote, The Roman diva system in which good emperors were divinized after death by vote of the Senate, end quote. Also, as Itai Gradel writes in Emperor Worship and Roman Religion, quote, Official policy in the state cult of the capital, where an emperor could receive divine worship only after he had died, end quote. Consider this carefully. It's extremely significant in understanding how the Vatican II sect fulfills prophecy about the beast. Although in the Roman Empire, certain living Roman emperors were at times given what was tantamount to divine honor in private or unofficial cults, in the official state cult at Rome itself, the emperors could not receive divine worship until they went through a special so-called deification ceremony after death. Let me repeat that. Pagan Rome, the beast that was, would quote deify pagan Roman kings in a special ceremony after their deaths. And only then could those deceased pagan Roman kings receive, in their view, a special spiritual status. Well, many have been shocked and wondering about the rather strange phenomenon that despite all of the scandals, evils, and bad fruits following Vatican II, John XXIII, Paul VI, and John Paul II have been, quote, canonized by the Vatican II sect all within a relatively short period of time, even though in the true Catholic Church only two popes in the past 500 years, Pius X and Pius V, were canonized. Because what we're seeing now, of course, is the canonization, not of individuals, but the canonization of the entire revolution of Vatican II. They're using canonization, the process of canonization, to make heroes of revolutionaries. Thomas More, John Fisher, Edmund Campion, all martyrs for the faith. It took 400 years for them to be canonized. And today, well, I remember Paul VI. When I was a kid, he was the Pope. It wasn't that long ago. They're just flying through these now, just pumping these guys out. Little, little, little saint-making factory. Well, when you recognize that what we're seeing is the return of pagan Rome, you will understand why this is happening. John XXIII, Paul VI, and John Paul II were literally pagan Roman kings of the Vatican city-state, as we've covered. They promoted wickedness, idolatry, and heresy. The Vatican II sect is the spiritual component of the end times beast. It is pagan Rome returned. So just as the pagan Roman Empire officially honored deceased pagan Roman kings and gave them a special title after death, so, too, the new version of the beast has moved to, quote, canonize all of the deceased antipopes, who were also pagan Roman kings, who played a significant role in the wicked Vatican II religion, with the exception thus far of John Paul I, who reigned only for 33 days. That's why there has been this push to, quote, canonize these evil Vatican II antipope Roman kings. It's a clear fulfillment of the prophecy about the return of the beast that was pagan Rome. It shows that we are living through the time of the end times beast. Now let me be very clear, I am not saying that a true Catholic canonization is idolatrous at all, or that it means that the person canonized is regarded as divine. Of course not. A true canonization by a valid pope means that the saint is to be venerated or honored as a holy person in heaven, not that the saint is considered God or divine. But during the great apostasy, the end times beast and the counter church have taken possession of the church's physical structures and occupied the temple of God. Thus, they attempt to hijack the church's process to impose evil and paganism. Consequently, the beast conducts false canonizations for its own evil ends. False canonizations thereby become a means by which the end times beast causes people to honor wicked pagan Roman kings, just as the pagan Roman Empire at various times caused people to honor wicked pagan Roman kings. However, in the case of John Paul II, when people accept him as a saint, they are not only implicated in his general wickedness, heresies, and idolatry, but they actually endorse his claim that he and everyone else is God. 
That's because John Paul II officially and repeatedly preached that every man is God. To accept him as a saint, therefore, is to endorse the claim that a deceased pagan Roman king is God, exactly as it happened in the beast that was. That's why John Paul II is singled out in the Apocalypse. That's why his wounding is mentioned. He is the image of pagan Rome. He introduced the World Historic Assisi Prayer Meeting, where the leaders of all the major false religions of the world were gathered together to pray for the first time. This matches precisely what is stated in 2 Thessalonians 2 about the man of sin being above and across from every so-called god or object of worship. For more on that, see our video, The Antichrist Identified. This is also why the altar at that idolatrous Assisi event, which is the most notorious event in the entire apostasy, had the word peace written on it. In the pagan Roman Empire, one of the most famous monuments was the Ara Pacis, which means the altar of peace. It was a pagan altar on which idolatry was conducted, dedicated to the name peace. And what do we see in the Vatican II counterchurch, which represents pagan Rome returned? The most famous or rather notorious event through which paganism and idolatry were introduced and conducted was the Assisi prayer meeting, which was the world day of prayer for peace. And at the very altar where the various false religions conducted their idolatrous worship, the word peace was written in various languages. That's not an accident. Assisi is the new Arapachis, it's the pagan altar of peace, in the new version of the beast. And it was introduced by Antipope John Paul II, the sixth king, who represents the end times beast. It also makes sense that in the beast that was, ancient Rome, the Arapachis was at Rome, since their, quote, peace was found in their military strength centered in Rome. But in the new version of the beast, or the beast returned, which rose with John Paul II, the goal is to mock Christian peace. St. Francis of Assisi is known as the saint of Christian peace. It therefore makes sense that the beast knew Arapachis would be in a town that is associated with Christian peace, Assisi. Now consider this. Herodian was a Greek historian born in AD 170 who wrote a famous partial history of the Roman Empire. He gives us some details about what they would do in the, quote, deification ceremony of Roman emperors after their deaths. He explains, quote, it is the Roman custom to elevate to divine status those emperors who, at their death, leave sons or designated successors. They call this honor deification. A wax image is fashioned in the exact likeness of the corpse and placed on a large high couch, end quote. He lists a number of other things associated with the ceremony. He explains that the couch containing the image of the deceased emperor would be carried out to the field. Quote, where, in the widest part of the plain, a square building has been constructed entirely of huge wooden beams in the shape of a house. The whole interior of this building is filled with firewood, end quote. He explains that this building had a few stories. He goes on to say, quote, when these rites have been completed, the emperor's successor puts a torch to the structure, which contains the couch with the image of the emperor, after which the people set it on fire on all sides. The flames easily and quickly consume the enormous pile of firewood and fragrant stuffs, end quote. So basically what they would do in this, quote, deification ceremony of the deceased pagan Roman king is light the image of the pagan king up in a bonfire. Well, what do you know? On April 2nd, 2007, during a ceremony that specifically marked the two-year anniversary of John Paul II's death, John Paul II's image or silhouette was seen in a bonfire in Poland. This made international headlines. These are images that everyone is talking about this morning. The late Pope John Paul II, as you know, left an indelible mark on the world's Catholics, especially those in his beloved native land of Poland. And now some are claiming that he is reaching out to them once more. CBS News correspondent Sheila McVicker reports. A familiar, iconic image. The bonfire was in Poland, the Pope's home, on the second anniversary of his death last April. Broadcast by Vatican TV, posted on religious websites, the faithful are reported to be logging on to make their own judgments. A Polish priest and close friend of the former pontiff has declared that he too sees an image of a person and believes it to be the Pope. John Paul II's image was seen lit up in a bonfire, just as they would light up the image of the deceased pagan Roman king in a bonfire during the, quote, deification ceremony, precisely because the beast returned with him, just as we have said. This is another clear fulfillment of the prophecy about the return of the beast that was. If this, along with the other facts we've covered, doesn't convince you that we are correct, that John Paul II's reign represented the fulfillment of prophecy about the return of the beast, then we don't know what will. Let's now consider another aspect of this prophecy. 
As we mentioned, the apocalypse indicates that the beast rises when five of the Roman kings are fallen and one is. That refers to pagan Rome returning with the EU during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king of the Vatican city-state. But the beast doesn't just exist in the last days. Remember, the beast was or existed during pagan Rome, and then it was replaced by Christian Europe before it returned in the last days under the sixth king of the Vatican city-state. The beast therefore had two stints, if you will, to its career. The beast was, then it was replaced by Christian Europe, and then it came back. Well, we believe that the statement about how five of the kings are fallen and one is also applies to when the beast first rose in the first century. The Roman Empire was technically established under Augustus in 27 BC, Julius Caesar's successor. Some argue, therefore, that Augustus was the first Roman emperor, and that if the seven kings of Apocalypse 17 have any application to the first seven emperors, the count should start with Augustus, not Julius Caesar. Others, however, think that the count should start with Julius Caesar because he was de facto the first of the Roman kings. In fact, Julius was considered to be the first Roman emperor by ancient Roman historian Dio Cassius and the ancient historian Josephus. Theophilus of Antioch, 2nd century bishop, also considered Julius to be the first emperor. In John 19.15 and Acts 17.7, the Roman emperors are called both king and Caesar. It makes sense, therefore, that if the reference in Apocalypse 17.10 to the beast rising when five are fallen has some application to the first seven kings around the time of the empire's establishment, the count should begin with Julius Caesar, not Augustus. Now, if we start the count of pagan Roman kings or emperors with Julius Caesar, the first seven would be Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba. As we can see, Nero is the sixth king, the one reigning when five are fallen. Again, Apocalypse 17.10 says of the seven kings, five of whom have fallen and one is. Now, there are two dominant views about when the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse was written. Many believe that it was written about AD 96 during the reign of the Emperor Domitian. Others believe that it was written in the 60s during the reign of the Emperor Nero. We believe that it was written in the 60s before the destruction of the temple during the reign of Nero. Those who date the book to the reign of Nero often refer to the statement that five of the kings have fallen, one is. They believe it supports the view that the book was written during the reign of Nero, the sixth king. Further, as we mentioned, Apocalypse 17.8 warns that the beast is about to rise, two verses before making reference to how five are fallen and one is. If the reference to five are fallen, one is, is also applied to the beast rising during the reign of Nero, as we believe it should be, that part of it fits well. That's because even though pagan Rome as an empire existed before Nero, Nero was the first Roman emperor or king to officially persecute Christianity. Thus, pagan Rome, with a pagan Roman king actively opposing Christ and the true church in an official manner at Rome, began with Nero. The beast that was, therefore, rose when five were fallen and one is. As ancient historian Eusebius says, Nero was the first of the emperors to be pointed out as a foe of the divine religion. As Tertullian said, at Rome, Nero was the first to stain with blood the rising faith. In AD 64, there was a devastating fire in Rome, and Nero blamed it on the Christians. He used it as an excuse to launch a major and vicious persecution against the church at Rome. Many were put to death, including Saints Peter and Paul, who were martyred on the same day in Rome. Consequently, in the ancient world, Nero was widely associated with the beast. Quote, it is true that the term beast was used as a designation for Nero in the ancient world. End quote. Therefore, it makes sense that just as the beast returns in the last days during the reign of the sixth king of the Vatican city-state, the beast that was likewise originally rose during the reign of the sixth Roman king, Nero. This is also important in our view in understanding certain passages such as Apocalypse 13, 5, quote, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, end quote. We believe that this refers to Nero's persecution of the church, which lasted exactly or approximately 42 months, with some dating the persecution as having begun in November AD 64 and lasting for 42 months until Nero's death in June AD 68. Likewise, the statement in Apocalypse 13 7 that the beast was allowed to make war on the saints applies well to Nero's persecution. Since the beast was and then was replaced but comes back in the final days, what the beast does in its first stint or in its second stint is referred to the same beast the beast that rises in both cases when five Roman kings have fallen. By way of analogy, a professional athlete could have a 10-year career and accumulate certain points. He could then retire for some time and then come back. Well, all of the points that he accumulated in his first stint or in his comeback stint 
would be attributed to the same player. Likewise, the beast, pagan Rome, had a reign in the first century under Nero, the sixth king. It persecuted the church for exactly or approximately 42 months. It made war against the saints, etc. It was then replaced by Christian Europe, but it comes back in the last days. And when it returns, it likewise rises during the reign of the sixth king at Rome, John Paul II. Because that's when you had a pagan Roman king preaching that man is divine, while he was actively opposing Christ at Rome during the reign of an empire in Europe. And all of the specifics that we covered show that the beast indeed returned during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king of the Vatican city-state. Since whatever the beast did in its first stint under Nero, or whatever it does in its second stint under the EU and pagan Europe in our time, is properly attributed to the beast, because it's the same beast, pagan Rome, we believe that some of the statements in the Apocalypse refer to what the beast did under Nero, such as having authority to act for 42 months, and some apply to what the beast does in the last days. The reference to 42 months, which we believe applies to Nero, doesn't prove that when the beast returns, it will only act for 42 months. It can simply refer to what the beast did under Nero. It should also be noted that some people believe that the passage about how five are fallen, etc. only applies to the time of Nero, but that view doesn't work. Among other things, that view cannot explain how the beast, if it only rises when five are fallen under Nero, truly was, because the beast would have been rising for the first time. What we are covering, however, explains both how the beast rises when five are fallen and how the beast was and is not and is to come. It also explains the wonder at the beast, which is clearly fulfilled in our time. Heck, what is going on? The beast was because it existed under pagan Rome, it then ceased to be under Christian Europe, but returns again during the reign of John Paul II, the sixth king of the Vatican city-state. Now, we mentioned the wounding of the head or king of the beast by the sword, which was fulfilled by John Paul II in a striking and specific manner. In Apocalypse 13.3, this wound is applied to a head of the beast, which Apocalypse 17 indicates is a Roman king. In Apocalypse 13.14, the wound is applied to the beast itself. The wound can be applied to the king of the beast and to the beast itself because the king who is wounded, John Paul II, is a reflection of the beast and is himself the Antichrist. That king who is wounded is the image of the beast. Let me explain. The wounding of the beast by the sword from which the beast recovers applies both to John Paul II and to pagan Rome itself. Pagan Imperial Rome, as an official persecutor of the church, was wounded by the sword of Constantine and Christianity. By the power of the gospel and the power of the sword, the empire was turned over to Christianity, and in the process, the beast, pagan Rome, suffered a wound that was seemingly fatal. The empire that had been the persecutor of Christianity became a Christian empire. Thus, Christian Europe gave pagan Rome a wound that was seemingly unto death. But with the repaganization of Europe under the wicked post-Vatican II kings of the Vatican city-state and the formation of the godless European Union empire, the wound that pagan Rome suffered at the hands of Christian Europe was healed. In Linera, Spain, the Church of Santa Barbara is now Chaos Temple, a skateboard park. But before you get angry with the owners of Frankenstein, understand that Europe today has more empty church buildings than it knows what to do with. Because Europe is, by and large, no longer Christian. These are the remnants of a lost civilization. Christian civilization. It was once at the very heart of European life and culture. Those days are long gone. The data is clear. Christianity in Europe is, is, is dying, coming to Europe. These are post-Christian people. They have moved away from Christianity. In Finland, a Christian member of parliament faces possible prison time for simply tweeting Bible verses that condemn homosexuality. And Bolivant warns it will probably get worse as Europe returns to its pagan roots. And this is so significant because even though Jews pushed for Jesus' death, the Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross by Romans. Rome thought that it had power over the Lord when it put him to death. When in fact, Jesus was not only offering the sacrifice by which men are saved, but in a few hundred years, the faith of Christ would conquer that entire Roman Empire and turn it into one for his own name. That was an additional aspect of Christ's victory over Rome. But in the last days, the beast strikes back, if you will, and returns paganism to Europe with a pagan king in Rome, preaching the very blasphemy, that is, that man is God, which pagan Roman kings taught, and he was doing it in a special way to mock the gospel, such as by preaching that man is the Christ of Matthew 16, 16. 
Hence, the beast that was returns. And that's why the wounding of the beast refers to pagan Rome itself being wounded by Christianity and recovering, but it also applies very specifically to the image of the beast, that is, the king who is wounded, John Paul II. As the image of the beast, John Paul II's life was, in miniature, a reflection of the beast as a whole. The beast is wounded by the sword and recovers. Likewise, John Paul II is literally wounded by the sword and recovers. The beast featured pagan Roman kings preaching that man is divine. John Paul II was literally a pagan Roman king preaching that man is divine. The beast had pagan kings, quote, deified after death with their image lit up in a bonfire. John Paul II was solemnly, quote, canonized, and his image was seen lit up in a bonfire on the two-year anniversary of his death. The beast promoted multifaceted idolatry in Europe. John Paul II institutes a world historic idolatrous prayer meeting at Assisi, which is a symbol of the great apostasy. The beast had a famous monument of idolatry called the Altar of Peace. John Paul II holds that idolatrous Assisi event on an altar dedicated to the name Peace. In the beast, various pagan Roman kings who promoted the position that man is divine had their images honored. John Paul II was a pagan Roman king who preached that man is divine and had his image honored, etc. And that's why when people honor his image, they are not only endorsing his wickedness, idolatry, etc., but they are venerating pagan Rome itself because that's what he represents. It's also important to note that in Apocalypse 13, the Greek verb that's used to describe the honor given to the image of the beast is proskuneo. That verb can mean worship or veneration. It is used by the church for the veneration of saints. The beast hijacks the church's canonization ceremony and uses it to impose the veneration of the Antichrist and other wicked figures of the Vatican to apostasy. All of these facts further support that what we said while John Paul II was alive, that is, that he's the Antichrist, is correct. What has happened since his death, with the veneration of his image and other things we've covered, further supports that conclusion. But despite all of the evidence, some object that he can't be the Antichrist because he's dead. Some argue that 2 Thessalonians 2.8 indicates that the lawless one, whom they consider to be the Antichrist, will be destroyed by or at the coming of Christ, and therefore that the Antichrist must continue his earthly life until the moment of the second coming. But that argument fails. First, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and perhaps one or two verses people bring up in the Apocalypse, can refer to what Jesus does on the Day of Judgment. It's a dogma that when Jesus Christ returns, all the dead, both the good and the wicked, will be brought back and presented before him. At that time, Jesus will, before he casts the wicked forever into the lake of fire, inflict whatever judgment and punishment on them that he deems fit. 2 Thessalonians 1, quote, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, end quote. 2 Peter 3, 7, The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. St. Peter refers to the destruction of the ungodly on the Day of Judgment. Evil people will not cease to exist, but they will be destroyed or overcome in the manner Christ deems appropriate and cast into hell. In 2 Thessalonians 2.8 there are textual variants, with some readings indicating that Christ will kill or slay the lawless one with the breath of his mouth, others indicating that he will consume him. In either case, it can refer to what Christ does on the Day of Judgment. In fact, even if one goes with the verb rendered kill, a form of that verb is rendered as take away or cancel in Hebrews 10.9, with the sense of rendering an effect null. Christ will take away or cancel the evil reigns of all evil people on the Day of Judgment. In fact, logical considerations about the order of these events would seem to strongly favor the view that any encounter Christ has with the wicked on earth comes after the general resurrection. St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, Further, the resurrection will precede the judgment, otherwise every eye would not see Christ judging. Now the burning of the world will precede the resurrection, end quote. First Thessalonians 4 indicates that the resurrection of the just will occur before there is any meeting between the Lord Jesus and the just who live until the second coming. Quote, this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord." End quote. As we can see, there will be no meeting between Christ and the just who are living until the dead in Christ rise. Well, John 5 speaks of the resurrection of the wicked as occurring at the same hour as the resurrection of the just. Quote, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. 
those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, end quote. It would seem to follow, therefore, that the resurrection of the wicked will precede any encounter that Christ has with a wicked person on earth. This favors the view that when Christ inflicts vengeance on his enemies, such as on the lawless one, that's in the context of the general judgment after the general resurrection, when those who have already died are back on earth. Thus, none of those few passages that people sometimes cite prove that the Antichrist must continue his earthly life until the moment Christ comes. They can simply refer to what happens in the context of the Day of Judgment. St. Peter also tells us that the Day of the Lord will come like a thief. Quote, but the Day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. In fact, it makes sense that the Antichrist would have his image officially honored after his death, as we've seen, rather than during his life, for a number of reasons. First, as we've shown, the coming of the beast and the Antichrist involves a return of pagan Rome. And in pagan Rome, the kings could not be officially, quote, deified at Rome until after death. Thus, we've seen the king who preached that every man is divine, who was wounded by the sword, etc., officially honored after death at the temple of God. And Pope Pius XI called St. Peter's Basilica a most ample temple. It is the temple of God mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. Second, since the coming of the Antichrist involves a takeover of the temple of God by the church's enemies and a religious deception, it makes sense that the honor given to the Antichrist's image would be imposed through a false canonization ceremony which occurs after death. And this is not just all about John Paul II. People are implicated in wickedness by accepting the new religion or honoring Paul VI or John XXIII, etc. By accepting the new religion or honoring any of the false saints who represented it, people thereby honor pagan Rome. But John Paul II, in a very specific way, represented the return of pagan Rome by preaching that man is God, by directly introducing idolatry, etc. Therefore, when people with a basic knowledge of his deeds consider him to be a saint, they are most directly implicated in mortal sin, heresy, and blasphemy. Further, there are many people out there, including, quote, traditionalists, who think that the Antichrist will be easily or widely recognized. That's totally wrong. Again, from Apocalypse 13, 14, quote, It deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, end quote. Notice, people are deceived into honoring the image of the Antichrist. Ergo, the people in general will not realize who the Antichrist is. Pope St. John Paul II. It's Jason Everett, author of St. John Paul the Great. Pope Francis visited the tomb of St. John Paul II today on his feast day. Another great gift idea for you is the St. John Paul II single decade rosary. And this rosary is made with large 10 millimeter wood beads, a silver plated papal crucifix, and a centerpiece that features a profile image of our beloved St. John Paul II in prayer. And look at this beautiful smile. Pope St. John Paul II with his welcoming, radiant smile. If this doesn't bring a good memory back to you, what will? It's also noteworthy that there's a textual variant in Apocalypse 13:14. The majority of all Greek manuscripts say, quote, it deceives mine who dwell on the earth, or as one could translate it, it deceives my own people who dwell on the earth. Others say that it deceives those who dwell on the earth. In either case, it signifies a religious deception that causes people to honor the image. The majority text reading would simply emphasize that this deception ensnares many who were baptized into God's people, but fall into evil by means of this deception. So all of those people who think that the Antichrist will be easily or widely recognized and that we're just waiting for the day he steps onto the world scene for all to see, don't know what they're talking about. His coming was by way of deception. Hence, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10 says that his coming is according to the working of Satan, in all power and signs and lying wonders, and in all seduction of iniquity to them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. This fits John Paul II. There were many false apparitions and false messages that popped up during his reign that convinced people he was good or, quote, Mary's Pope. In fact, the false apparition of Medjugorje began not even two months after the wounding of John Paul II. It was one of the many false signs that deceived people about the Antichrist. Further, even though John Paul II defrauded the world of the true third secret of Fatima, he managed to get himself recognized as the hero of the false third secret of Fatima, which they decided to release. That was another part of the deception that surrounded the Antichrist. Also, the word Antichrist is not in the Apocalypse. However, the one who is wounded and then has his image honored is frequently understood to be the Antichrist. We've presented overwhelming evidence that that refers to John Paul II. 
Indeed, in 1 John 2.22, we find scripture's inspired definition of the Antichrist as follows, quote, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son, end quote. So the Antichrist is defined in Holy Scripture as the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, and by doing so that person denies the Father and the Son. That's the Antichrist. Well, that's exactly what Antipope John Paul II did in his very first homily that marked the beginning of his, quote, ministry. He declared that the new truth about man is that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, when that truth, of course, only applies to Jesus, not to man in general. He thereby denied that Jesus is the singular Christ and directly fulfilled the definition of the Antichrist. And he proceeded to teach that same heresy in many ways throughout his anti-papacy. See our video, quote, St. John Paul II exposed. And the same man is the sixth king, was wounded, had his image honored, etc. That's because he was the Antichrist. Pope Pius X also said that the distinguishing mark of Antichrist is man in the place of God, and that was the distinguishing mark of Antipope John Paul II. Moreover, the Whore of Babylon sits on top of the end times beast. The Whore of Babylon is connected to the Antichrist. Our videos Revelation 18.2 just happened and Babylon has fallen fallen give overwhelming evidence that prophecies about the Whore of Babylon have been fulfilled with striking precision at St. Peter's Basilica and in Vatican City in our day. In 1 Peter 5.13, St. Peter writing from Rome calls it Babylon. In the New Testament, Babylon is not just a code name for Rome, but more specifically it refers to the place in Rome where St. Peter is located. St. Peter is buried under the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. It therefore makes perfect sense that prophecies about end times Babylon would be fulfilled at that very spot where St. Peter is buried. And that is what we have seen. For example, in Revelation 18.2, we read that the angel cried out with a strong voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she has become the habitation of demons, and the prison of every unclean spirit, and the prison of every unclean bird, and the prison of every unclean and hated beast. This prophecy refers to Babylon becoming the prison of every unclean bird and beast. This prophecy was specifically fulfilled at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican on December 8, 2015, during the Fiat Lux light show. During this event, images of different birds and animals were projected onto the front of St. Peter's Basilica, precisely corresponding to what is stated in Apocalypse 18.2. The word that is translated in Apocalypse 18.2 as prison could also be translated as cage. Due to the columns on the front of St. Peter's Basilica, the animals look like they were being held in a cage slash prison, exactly as the prophecy states. The Fiat Lux event in the Vatican symbolized the fall of the city of Rome into uncleanness and apostasy in the final days as a result of the return of paganism to Rome under the Vatican II antipopes and their end times counterchurch, the Vatican II sect. This is what the prophecies about the Whore of Babylon in general are about. The Catholic Church is not the Whore of Babylon. The Vatican II sect, the end times counter church, is the Whore of Babylon. St. John writes that Babylon has fallen, which indicates that the place where St. Peter is located, Babylon, stood strongly before, but now in the last days it has become the habitation of demons. It's also not an accident that this event, which fulfilled apocalyptic prophecy about Babylon, occurred on the 50th anniversary of the close of Vatican II. Vatican II, which closed on December 8, 1965, was the very Council of Apostasy that ushered in and characterizes the apocalyptic counterchurch, the end times Whore of Babylon. The Vatican II sect clearly fulfills prophecy about the Whore of Babylon in many other ways as well. Apocalypse 18.3 says that all nations have drunk the wine of her rage for fornication. The Apocalypse mentions the wine of the Whore's fornication more than once because after Vatican II, changes were made to the wine portion of the form of consecration in the new Mass. The change of many to all in the form of consecration falsified the words of Christ and caused those, quote, masses to be invalid. The whore is said to be clothed round about in purple and scarlet because bishops wear purple and cardinals wear scarlet. And men in purple and scarlet are a common sight in Vatican City. 
The whore has various externals, but not the substance of the true Catholic Church. The whore is drunk with the blood of saints and martyrs because it mocks the saints by its false ecumenism and religious indifferentism. In Apocalypse 17.6, we read that when St. John saw the whore, he wondered great wonder. The noun translated wonder in that verse is thauma. It's only used one other time in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 11.14, where it is used to describe the shock, astonishment, or confusion engendered by false apostles posing as apostles of Christ. It makes sense that when St. John saw the whore, he wondered great wonder, because it's a counterchurch led by false apostles of Peter, that is, antipopes who claim to be successors of the Apostle Peter, but are not. Indeed, when the Apocalypse says that people shall wonder to see the beast because it has come back, it uses the verb thaumadzo, the verbal form of thauma. That's a further indication that when pagan Rome returns, it will be under the appearance of apostles and ministers of Christ. That is, it will be pagan Rome under the appearance of the church, a counter-church. Hence, when pagan Rome returns in the last days under the appearance of apostles and ministers of Christ, it is not engaging in a physical persecution, but an attempted spiritual subversion. According to Apocalypse 17.4, the whore has a golden cup in her hand. This refers to the false priesthood and false masses in the Vatican II counterchurch. Apocalypse 18.6 refers to the cup wherein the whore has mixed or mingled. That's a reference to the mixing of water and wine at the new mass. That reference signifies that the whore has committed severe violations in that area of liturgy by falsifying the true worship of the Catholic Church. Interestingly, the ancient depiction of the woman Europa is on a vase used for mixing water and wine. That's another indication that this reference in Apocalypse 18.6 is to Europe having become a spiritual whore by means of its apostasy from Catholicism and its liturgical abominations. Further, the statement in that verse, double to her double according to her works, corresponds to 1 Timothy 5.17. There we read that priests who rule well are esteemed worthy of double honor. But Apocalypse 18.6 says of the whore, double to her double according to her works, because she represents false priests and false ministers who act and rule in an evil fashion. One could give more examples of the connection between the Vatican II sect and the whore of Babylon. Since the Vatican II sect is clearly the whore of Babylon and the whore sits on top of the end times beast, it makes sense that the Antichrist, the one who is wounded and then has his image honored, was connected to the events in Vatican City during this period. This further supports the conclusion that John Paul II was the Antichrist. Moreover, when the beast under Nero put St. Peter to death, Peter was killed on Vatican Hill, which is located in present-day Vatican City. So, when the beast rose in the first century, it persecuted the visible leader of the church in that very place, what is now Vatican City. Peter was buried there, in what is now Vatican City, with his grave located under the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica. When Christianity spiritually conquered Rome and Europe, the most prominent physical structure in Christianity was built at that very spot where St. Peter is buried, in what is now Vatican City. It therefore makes sense that when the beast comes back, and the whore is sitting on top of it, the prophecies will play out right there, in Vatican City, where St. Peter is buried. And that is what has happened. That's why we see that prophecies about the beast, the seven kings, the Antichrist, and the whore of Babylon have been fulfilled right there, in Vatican City. The fulfillment of these prophecies in Rome serves to prove, not disprove, that the Catholic Church is the one true church of Jesus Christ. The great deception centers around deceiving those who claim to be Catholic and those who claim to profess union with Rome. You will find much biblical proof for the Catholic faith on our website vaticancatholic.com and in our material. The prophecies about Rome's fall and whoredom concern the city of Rome's fall from the Catholic faith because the Catholic faith is the one true faith of Jesus Christ outside of which there is no salvation. But to be a true Catholic, one must be a traditional Catholic. Now, in this video, we've thus far focused on the beast with seven heads, that is, on pagan Rome returned, the Antichrist, the seven kings, and the whore of Babylon. The beast with seven heads is the first beast mentioned in Apocalypse 13. That beast is further explained in Apocalypse 17. However, Apocalypse 13 makes reference to another beast that comes up out of the earth. This beast has two horns, and it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its sight or on its behalf. It is this second beast that causes people to worship or venerate the first beast, which had the wound by the sword. That is to say, in our view, the second beast causes people to worship or venerate pagan Rome and John Paul II, who is the image of pagan Rome. Well, in the pagan Roman Empire, when a deceased pagan Roman king was, quote, deified, it was typically the successor of the king who prompted the Senate to engage in that process. Quote, the deification of a deceased emperor was authorized by a formal decree of the Senate, which alone had power to introduce new forms of worship, but the Senate acted at the suggestion of the reigning emperor, end quote. 
Thus, Julius Caesar was, quote, deified with the help of Augustus, his successor, and Augustus was, quote, deified with the help of his successor, Tiberius. And what do we see with the successor of John Paul II? His successor, Antipope Benedict XVI, fast-tracked John Paul II's cause for, quote, sainthood. He overrode the five-year waiting period and, quote, beatified him. And then his successor, Antipope Francis, completed the process by, quote, canonizing John Paul II, along with Paul VI and John XXIII. It's interesting that in pagan Rome, it was the Senate that formally declared the, quote, deification, with the Roman king involved in suggesting or recommending it. And in the new version of the beast, we see that Antipope Benedict XVI, who was a king of the Vatican city-state, started the process and that it was formally completed under Antipope Francis, who was not a Roman king. Could the fact that there were two men involved in causing people to worship the beast, both of whom were present at John Paul II's, quote, canonization, namely Antipope Benedict XVI and Antipope Francis, be the reason that the beast out of the earth has two horns? Perhaps. It's also interesting that followers of the counterchurch are divided between Benedict and Francis, with some holding that Benedict XVI is the valid pope, others holding that it's Francis. Little do they realize that both are apostate antipopes of a counterchurch. Moreover, Apocalypse 17.10 makes a distinct reference to one is when describing the sixth king. In Greek it says, the one. The sixth king is the one. That reference to the one connects in our view with Apocalypse 13.3, where we read about one of the beast's heads who is wounded. The sixth king is the one who is wounded. Likewise, in Apocalypse 17.10, when describing the seventh king, there is a distinct reference to the other. The seventh king is the other. And then in Apocalypse 13.11, the second beast that comes out of the earth is described as another. The word another there is the same word, just in a different form that we find in Apocalypse 17.10 when it refers to the seventh king. So just as the one who is the sixth king is the one who is wounded, we believe that the other king, namely the seventh, Benedict XVI, denotes when the other slash second beast rises. To put it another way, the reason that Apocalypse 17 focuses specifically on the sixth and seventh kings is that the first beast of Apocalypse 13, the one, rises under the sixth king, and the second beast of Apocalypse 13, the other, which causes people to honor the first beast, rises under the seventh king. So, scripture tells us that the second beast causes people to honor the first beast which had the wound by the sword and yet lived, and what do we see under Benedict XVI? Well, Benedict XVI starts the process by which people venerate the Antichrist and pagan Rome, similar to how in pagan Rome, the successor of the deceased pagan king was involved with causing people to worship him. Apocalypse 13.12 says that the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in its sight, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. The second beast, which you might say is the Vatican II sect, starting with the seventh king, exercises all the spiritual authority in the sight of pagan Europe, and uses it to cause people to honor the image of the Antichrist and the wicked pagan figures who represent the return of pagan Rome. In Apocalypse 13.13, we read that the second beast performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men. In the Acts of the Apostles, activity, gifts, or signs of the Holy Spirit are associated with fire from heaven. The reference in Apocalypse 13.13 to fire from heaven in the sight of men refers, in our view, to spiritual signs and activity falsely attributed to the Holy Spirit. In other words, it denotes false miracles and false signs worked in the Vatican II counterchurch. This false fire from heaven would include various false miracles that paved the way for the false canonizations of John Paul II, Paul VI, and other heretics in the counterchurch, such as Mother Teresa. It would also include the false charismatic movement, which constitutes a false fire from heaven. The charismatic movement was instrumental in building the cult of the Antichrist, John Paul II, in various parts of the world. John Paul II's image in the bonfire, which was considered to be his appearance from heaven in fire, on the two-year anniversary of his death, directly connects with the false deification ceremony in pagan Rome as we covered, but it would also be included in the category of false fire from heaven in the sight of men. Various false signs have occurred in the Vatican II sect, which played a role in building momentum for the veneration of the Antichrist and pagan Rome. Significantly, the word translated in the sight in this verse is anopion. It can mean in the eyes or in the estimation of. That's how it's used in Luke 16, 15, for example, where Jesus says to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before, or in the estimation of, anopion, men, but God knows your hearts. Thus, fire coming down from heaven, anopion, tone, anthropon, can mean activity that is considered by men to be fire from heaven, slash the work of the Holy Spirit, when in reality it's a false sign. Apocalypse 13.15 says that it was given to the second beast to give life to the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should speak, and should cause that whosoever would not worship the image of the beast should be slain. 
The first part of this verse about giving life to the image of the beast fits the false canonization of John Paul II and the process leading up to it. The ceremony itself, which featured John Paul II's image, was transmitted in an unprecedented 3D TV transmission. Quote, the ceremony will also be beamed into 3D movie theaters across Europe and in North and South America in what is being touted as the first convergence of HD, 3D, and 4K technologies for such a high-profile multimedia 3D event. Millions of people will follow the canonization of John Paul II and John XXIII, and the Vatican's television center will use up to 33 TV cameras and 9 satellites to make it happen. The Vatican will team up with other TV companies like Sky, Sony, Globecast, DBW Communication, and Nexo Digital. Not even the 2014 Sochi Olympics had so many satellites. We decided to use technology so that all countries can experience the ceremony, even if it is from afar. We also want historians to have a high-quality record of the canonization. And so the main goal is for all people to experience the canonization in St. Peter's Square, even if they're at home. To make that happen, 13 cameras will air the ceremony in 3D. 15 in high definition and 5 in 4K resolution. The event will also make its way to the big screen. Roughly 500 movie theaters will air the ceremony live in 20 countries. The TV coverage also featured images and footage of John Paul II. The false canonizations of the antipopes were also tantamount to false declarations of eternal life for the representatives of pagan Rome, such as John Paul II, Paul VI, etc. The word translated as slain or killed in the second part of this verse is a form of the verb apokteno. It doesn't always mean physically kill. It can simply mean cause the loss of spiritual life. The second beast, which acts with the authority of the Vatican II sect, indeed imposes the worship of the Antichrist and the acceptance of the Vatican II religion under pain of being cut off. Because what we're seeing now, of course, is the canonization, not of individuals, but the canonization of the entire revolution of Vatican II. They're using canonization, the process of canonization, to make heroes of revolutionaries. The heresies of the Vatican II religion represent pagan Rome returned. You must accept those heresies and the false saints of the counterchurch under pain of being cut off from its communion. So, however one might precisely think of the second beast, whether you consider it to be the Vatican II sect as a religious entity exercising all the spiritual power in the sight of pagan Europe, or more specifically as the Vatican II sect as it acts under Antipope Benedict XVI and following, the evidence we have presented about the first beast being pagan Rome returned under the EU, post-Vatican II Rome being the Whore of Babylon, John Paul II being the Antichrist, the one who is wounded and then has his image honored, the seven kings being the seven kings of the Vatican city-state, the wonder at the beast being fulfilled and how people react when they see the return of pagan Rome, etc., is overwhelming. This is what is happening. This is why what we've seen in Rome has occurred. And the second beast causes people to honor this wicked return of pagan Rome. Thus, the people who think that Benedict XVI was a valid pope or good are deceived. He was one of the most wicked heretics in history. He was an apostate antipope and a major deceiver. See our video, The Heresies of Benedict XVI, and our file on his heresies. Benedict XVI, along with the apostate antipope Francis, caused people to venerate the Antichrist. Even Benedict XVI's decision to give wider access to the Latin Mass was a deceptive move because the devil knew that by that time most of the, quote, priests offering it were invalidly ordained, having been ordained in the invalid new rite of Paul VI. It was a calculated attempt to keep people believing that there is hope in the Whore of Babylon when there isn't. The devil wanted to keep people under the antipopes for as long as possible so that they'd eventually have to accept the, quote, canonization of the Antichrist, John Paul II, as well as Paul VI, John XXIII, etc. Some people who have figured out that Francis is not Catholic and cannot be the Pope think that Benedict XVI is the true Pope. They are wrong. Benedict XVI was not a valid Pope. He was an apostate antipope. It's also not just a coincidence in our view that Benedict XVI's name in Greek, Benedictos, equals exactly 666. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the name Benedict, of course. It's just an identifier. He was the seventh king under whom this process to venerate the Antichrist and pagan Rome got started. Further, in our view, the mark of the beast on the hand or forehead is a spiritual mark. It represents the false ecclesiastical and priestly authority of the Vatican II sect, which holds spiritual authority over people in end times Europe and around the world. The Vatican II sect doesn't have valid authority from God, but it has influence over the peoples, nations, and languages that follow the counter-church. That's why the Whore of Babylon is said to sit upon many waters, which the Apocalypse tells us are peoples, nations, and languages. The counter-church has sway over the people who wrongly think that its antipopes are true popes. 
That's why the false traditionalists who obstinately recognize the Vatican II antipopes in the face of the evidence are wicked false teachers and instruments of Satan. They keep people in heresy and in false positions. Those who tell you to remain in the Vatican II sect are deceivers. You are not staying with the Catholic Church. You are staying with the whore of Babylon. It is not the Catholic Church. Hence Apocalypse 18.4 says of end times Babylon, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. Scripture's admonition to come out of end times Babylon also indicates that antipopes reign there during this period, for Scripture would not tell people to remove themselves from communion with the true pope. With regard to the mark without which no one can buy or sell, we believe that refers to the currency of the EU, which has the image of Europa or Europe, the beast empire, on it. It's noteworthy that the Apocalypse tells us that the beast has seven heads and ten horns. The ten horns refer to the nations that originally composed the power center of the EU. In fact, the Western European Union originally had ten member countries which were bound to a mutual defense obligation under the Brussels Treaty. This mutual defense alliance of ten included the EU power centers of Brussels, France, and Italy. The Western EU had its functions gradually transferred to the European Union, but it's not just a coincidence in our view that there were originally 10 countries in the Western European Union Military Defense Alliance. Thus, the EU had 10 parts or components or aspects of its defense. That corresponds to the description of the beast having 10 horns. With regard to Francis, who is a totally apostate antipope, he is indeed speaking for pagan Rome at this time. He represents the counter-church unmasked. Indeed, many people who are blind to the evil of the deceivers, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, are appalled by Francis. Of hedonism and sexual aberration called liberation. That gospel, that anti-gospel, is promoted all throughout the world. And it is becoming increasingly, as John Paul II and his successor predicted it would be, a tyranny. The media doesn't help at all because the media is on the other side and uses the Pope's words to bash Catholic activists in America and all over the West. Well, their recognition that Francis has problems doesn't indicate that they've come to the full truth. It is rather a fulfillment of the prophecy about how followers of the counter-church shall wonder and be shocked by the activity of the beast, especially after the seventh king. We have sometimes been shocked by things that we have heard. If those people really want to wake up and embrace the full truth and be saved, they need to recognize and reject the entire Vatican II sect and its wicked antipopes. The reason that God allowed this to happen is the bad will of people. God saw that people didn't appreciate the true faith, the true sacraments, the true mass, etc. So he allowed it almost all to be taken away. The true Catholic Church still exists and it is visible, despite the counter-church in Rome. You are listening to a visible member of the true church in our day. But God has allowed the true church to be reduced almost as far as it can be in the great apostasy because people don't deserve more than that. As Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth, Luke 18.8. People in our day, generally speaking, don't deserve to have a true pope in Rome who is recognized by the whole world. They don't deserve to have a flourishing Catholic presence in every diocese. They don't deserve it. They deserve desolation. And thus God allowed almost everything to be taken away except for a faithful remnant so that only those who really strive after him, who live for God and not for the opinions of men and the crowds, will find the faith and embrace it. In Isaiah 121, we read about Jerusalem, the holy city in the Old Testament period. Quote, How has the faithful city that was full of judgment become a harlot? Justice dwelt in it, but now murderers. God allowed his holy city to become a harlot. That applied to the city of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. It applies to the city of Rome, not the Catholic Church, in the final days. Many people look at the current situation of Rome and lose faith in God and the Catholic Church as a result. That is foolish. Some people have decided to become Protestants, Eastern schismatics, or even atheists. They are falling prey to the devil's trap. As we've shown, this situation was prophesied. The Catholic Church always has been and remains the one true church of Jesus Christ. To be saved, you need to be a true traditional Catholic who rejects the Vatican II sect and practices the true faith. Our material explains how to do that.